Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Alleluia. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, on this day you open the way of eternal life to every race and nation by the promised gift of your Holy Spirit. Shed abroad this gift throughout the world by the preaching of the gospel, that it may reach to the ends of the earth through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the letter of Paul to the Romans, chapter 8, verses 22 through 27. We know that the whole creation has been groaning in labor pains until now, and not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly while we wait for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. For in hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what is seen? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought, but that very Spirit intercedes with sides too deep for words. And God, who searches the heart, knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. The Word of the Lord. A reading from Psalms 104, verses 25 through 35 and 37. O Lord, how manifold are your works! In wisdom you have made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. Yonder is the great and wide sea, with its living things too many to number creatures both small and great. There move the ships, and there is that Leviathan, which you have made for the sport of it. All of them look to you to give them their food and due season. You give it to them, they gather it. You open your hand, and they are filled with good things. You hide your face 
and they are terrified. You take away their breath, and they die and return to their dust. You send forth your spirit, and they are created. And so you renew the face of the earth. May the glory of the, earth, of the Lord endure forever. May the Lord rejoice in all his works. He looks at the earth and it trembles. He touches the mountains and they smoke. I will sing to the Lord as long as I live. I will praise my God while I have my being. May these words of mine please him. I will rejoice in the Lord. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Alleluia. A reading from Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 21. When the day of Pentecost had come, the disciples were all together in one place. And suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind. And it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues, as of fire, appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at this sound the crowd gathered and was bewildered because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia, and Pamphylia, Egypt, and parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs, in our own languages, we hear them speaking about God's deeds and power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others smeared and said, They are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be. God declares that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy, and I will show portents in the heaven above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and smoky mist. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. The word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to John. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus said to his disciples, When the Advocate comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of Truth who comes from the Father, he will testify on my behalf. You also are to testify, because you have been with me from the beginning. I did not say these things to you from the beginning, because I was with you, but now I am going to him who sent me. Yet none of you asks me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Advocate will not come to you. But if I go, 
I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will prove the world wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment, about sin because they do not believe in me, about righteousness because I am going to the Father and you will see me no longer, about judgment because the ruler of this world has been condemned. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the Spirit of Truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak on his own, but will speak whatever he hears, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, because he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine, for this reason, I say that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Good morning and happy Pentecost Sunday. A few weeks ago, <clears throat> when we started our Tuesday Bible study, we first listened to this powerful, if a little strange, story we have just heard from the Book of Acts and we started to share a bit about our own experiences of the Holy Spirit, the way we have felt the Holy Spirit coming in our lives. And as you can probably imagine, those experiences weren't quite as dramatic as the experience the Apostle had on that day, although some of us agreed easily that they were quite powerful and a little strange too. Our stories of encountering the Holy Spirit were quite different for each one of us. But one of the things we all noticed is that we got pretty emotional remembering these experiences and telling them to one another. Because we experienced that God was here. God was here, even if we couldn't explain how or why. Theologians say that the Holy Spirit is the one who mediates the presence of the Lord, the one who enables the risen Christ to come among us. And it is certainly what they can conclude when studying closely the passage of John we have just heard. We are once again back in the farewell discourse, or last Sunday with it. And um, last Sunday we were in chapter 17, but today we go back one chapter to spend time on the promise of the Holy Spirit. A reading, of course, that is appropriate for Pentecost, even though the passage of Acts is probably much more well known. And so, as you probably know right by now, Jesus, in this passage, is about to depart. But he promises his disciples that he won't leave them on their own, and that he will send them the Advocate, the one who testifies on his behalf. The Holy Spirit will take what is Jesus, and we have to understand his teaching, his miracles, but also the story of his life, death, and resurrection. And the, dis and the Spirit will reveal the truth about Jesus. Now that's a lot of words, isn't it? And we got a, a bit used to that after four weeks in this passage of John's. But still, we wonder, what does it mean in the end? Well, I was wondering about that too when I was reminded of those stories we shared about the Holy Spirit during our Bible study. As I have just said, one of the things we all noticed is how emotional we got as we remembered those stories, because what they all had in common is that we had experienced God, God's presence. God was there for us. God, as we came to know God, revealed in Jesus. And so, theologians will say to us that the Holy Spirit is the one who mediates the presence of the Lord. John will say the Holy Spirit reveals the truth about Jesus after Jesus has physically left the disciples. And for me, I would put it with even more simple words, as I remember the expression on your faces as we shared our stories. And this is how I would put it. The Holy Spirit is the one who makes it real. The Holy Spirit is the one who makes it real. The Holy Spirit is the one making God, God revealed in Jesus, real for us, in our day and age, in our particular life condition. 
The Holy Spirit is the one who takes the story of Jesus' life and everything you've ever been taught about God and every question you have ever asked and prayer you prayed, and the Holy Spirit makes it alive, real and present before you. The Holy Spirit comes and then you know it's real. And you know it's not so much in your head or even in your heart, but in the depth of your being. And yes, sometimes you can get pretty emotional about that. And it might not be a powerful feeling every day, but you can go back to it again and again and something settles in you and you know it's true. I really like it, actually, that we read from John's today. Maybe you've learned about the Holy Spirit at church, at Sunday school, and if you're like me, you've learned about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. You know, wisdom, self-control, kindness, and so on. And this is all what the Holy Spirit does, according to Paul. And so this is what we learn at church. But John, John does not talk about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' mouth, the Holy Spirit is the gift. The Holy Spirit is the gift. The Holy Spirit is the gift and the gift among all the gifts. You know, it's not a gift you're happy to receive and then you put on a shelf and you forget about it. The Holy Spirit is a gift that keeps on giving, who continually brings to us the presence of the Lord and renews the presence of the Lord among us. And we know that we pray the Holy Spirit in our Eucharistic prayer, right? Every week we ask for the presence of the Lord through the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the gift because the Holy Spirit is the present. The Holy Spirit is the presence. In John's Gospel, there are no complicated Sunday school lessons about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is simply the one that makes it real. After Jesus is gone, the disciples, afflicted by sorrow, will suddenly wake up from their mourning because they will receive the gift, the gift that makes the Lord present. And at their turn, they will have to make the Lord present for others. And that's, of course, all the story of the Book of Acts. The Holy Spirit mediates the presence of the Lord, but he also mediates through the, through the disciple, through the apostle. <clears throat> and this is, to me, the heart of our Christian calling. Experiencing the presence of the Lord, we have to make God real for each other and for all others. And we know that after they have had this extraordinary experience, that's all that the disciples are going to do, making God real for people in words and action, and also just in being the persons they have become. They will bear testimony. And they don't necessarily bear witness with some kind of mind-blowing experiences, although sometimes they do. But they bear witness by their patience and kindness, their faithfulness and their hope, their attention to the little ones, their readiness to tell the story of Jesus, to share what they have, to rejoice in goodness. And these are, after all, all the gifts of the Spirit. It does not mean that they had it all figured out. And we can see that as well a lot in the Book of Acts. But the Apostle had times of doubt, discouragement and conflict. From John's Gospel, it does not seem that we are meant to experience the Holy Spirit on our own. It's a communal experience. We get to know God when we gather together. We make God real for others, and we make God real for each other. As Christians, we are meant to support and comfort each other, and to continue to seek together how the life of Jesus speaks to us right now, and how we want to live it out in our Christian community, in our families, in our neighborhood. Together, we are to be witnesses of the Lord's presence. presence as a church. Today, in our in-person gathering, we will receive John Richard as a novice in the community of the gospel, and we will also commission on a new vestry. And I would like to remind you that this is the root of our call. Before leading liturgy, or conducting meetings, or making decisions about the church, our call is experiencing the presence of the Lord to make it real, to make it manifest and express it 
in the way we worship and pray, in the way we involve ourselves in our communities and serve them, in the way we relate to each other, and in the way we live. And I would even add, even also in the way we can disagree with each other or be in conflict or hurt or disappointed with each other. When Jesus said to the disciple that the Holy Spirit will come to reveal the truth, it's also a warning. It means Christians will have to deal with what's broken in themselves, in their community, and in the world. So now how do we do that? Where do we start? Well, that's the sense of a ceremony we will have today. Uh, we will, um, the candidates, we all, will all be making a step towards the altar and it's something traditional uh, we do in church. Because today there is no Sunday school exam and you don't have to be a special people. The disciples certainly weren't and the evangelist actually insisted a lot about how ordinary they were. But they were present, present, given to, given to God. And that's exactly what we do at the altar. We give to God the bread, the wine, but mostly we make ourselves present. We make ourselves gift. We give ourselves and we, and we have to allow God to use us. I read one day a beautiful quotation that I never forgot that said, God uses our availability rather than our ability. God uses our availability rather than our ability. And you know, we're obsessed with our abilities or lack thereof, but we forget we first need to be available and receptive. Of course, we need abilities to serve, but the first thing is to allow God to use us to mediate God's presence, to allow the presence of the Holy Spirit inside of us. So the question I have for all of us today is, will we take the first step? Amen. Let us confess our faith. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Prayers of the People Father, we pray for your holy Catholic Church. That we all may be one. Grant that every member of the Church may truly and humbly serve you. That your name be glorified by all people. We pray for Michael, our presiding bishop, our bishops Susan, Jennifer, and Porter, and for all bishops, for Fanny, our priest, and for all priests and deacons and all ministers of your church, and for the congregations and clergy of Holy Comforter, Vienna, St. Anne's, Reston, St. Paul's, Owens, King George, and St. Stephen's, Richmond. That they may be faithful ministers of your word and sacraments. We pray for all who govern and hold authority in the nations of the world, for our president, Joe, for our governor, Ralph, and for all leaders of the nations and for all the men and women of our armed forces and those working abroad and their families at home, especially Nick. That there may be justice and peace on earth. Give us grace to do your will in all that we undertake. 
that our works may be favored in your sight. Have compassion on those who suffer from any grief or trouble, especially Mackenzie, Wally, Dave, Mikey, Kay, Betty, Jean, Renee, Mary, and family, Renell, Winston, Jimmy, Kathy, Nikki, Lynn, Jojo, John Richard, Barbara, Marion, Sharon, Stephen, Ralph, Jim, Lou, Rich, Greg, Connie, David, George, Casey, Robert and Heather, Wendy and family, Ken and Maggie, Braden, and Jean and Greg. That they may be delivered from their distress. Give to the departed eternal rest, especially Bill. Let light perpetually shine upon them. We praise you for your saints who have entered into joy. May we also come to share in your heavenly kingdom. Let us pray for our own needs and those of others. O Lord our God, accept the fervent prayers of your people in the multitude of your mercies. Look with compassion upon us and all who turn to you for help. For you are gracious, O lover of souls, and to you we give glory, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and sacrifice to God. Our worship continues with Eucharistic prayer B. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, through Jesus Christ our Lord, in the fulfillment of his true promise, the Holy Spirit came down on this day from heaven, lighting upon the disciples to teach them and to lead them into all truth, uniting peoples of many tongues in the confession of one faith and giving to your church the power to serve you as a royal priesthood 
and to preach the gospel to all nations. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Thanks to you, O God, for the goodness and love which you have made known to us in creation, in the calling of Israel to be your people, in your words spoken through the prophets, and above all, in the world made flesh, Jesus, your Son. For in these last days you sent him to be incarnate from the Virgin Mary, to be the Savior and Redeemer of the world. In him you have delivered us from evil and made us worthy to stand before you. In him, you have brought us out of error into truth, out of sin into righteousness, out of death into life. On the night before he died for us, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks to you, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of a new covenant, which is shed for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sin. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, according to his command, O Father, we remember his death, we proclaim his resurrection, we await his coming in glory, and we offer a sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you, O Lord of all, presenting to you from your creation this bread and this wine. We pray you, gracious God, to send your Holy Spirit upon this gift, that there may be the sacrament of the body of Christ and his blood of a new covenant. Unite us to your Son in his sacrifice, that we may be acceptable through him, being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In the fullness of time, put all things in subjection under your Christ, and bring us to the heavenly country, where with St. Margaret and all your saints, we may enter the everlasting heritage of your sons and daughters. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, the firstborn of all creation, the head of a church, and the author of our salvation by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now, as the Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to pray. Our, Our Father, Lord, who art in heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia, Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Alleluia. <laughs>
gifts of God for you, the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith, with thanksgiving. We can say together the act of spiritual reception. My Lord Jesus, Jesus I, I believe that you are present, present in the blessed sacrament. I love you above all things, and I desire you in my soul. Since I cannot now receive you sacramentally, come spiritually into my heart, as though you were already there, I embrace you and unite myself wholly to you. Permit not that I should ever be separated from you. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, we thank you for feeding us with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and for assuring us in these holy mysteries that we are the living members of the body of your Son and heirs of your eternal kingdom. And now, Father, send us out to do the work you have given us to do, to love and serve you as faithful witnesses of Christ our Lord. To him, to you, and to the Holy Spirit, be honor and glory, now, now and forever. Amen. May Almighty God, who enlightened the minds of the disciples by pouring out upon them the Holy Spirit, make you rich with his blessing, that you may abound more and more in that spirit forever. Amen. Alleluia, the Lord is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Alleluia. Let us go forth in the name of Christ. Thanks be to God.